Well, I know I'm very excited about this opportunity yeah. Yeah. to have an informal chat, but especially with this very special audience, because what we know about this afternoon is that this is a really exceptional opportunity for people who are sitting, studying at UW, studying at Laurier, living in KW, and perhaps have an eye on uh, foreign service jobs. Maybe they'd like to work abroad in an embassy. Maybe they'd like to work for the Canadian mission in New York or Geneva. So this is a fabulous opportunity for you to get some insights on how to do that and find out if you really want to do it based on the insider's view uh, that we'll get here today. So we're going to start off with uh, uh, Mr. Heinbecker and myself having a little chat. And I'm going to pose a few questions to him that I think are, are worth thinking about today. And then we'll open it up and give you the opportunity to ask questions yourselves. Okay. Why don't we start, uh, Paul, with the fact that you, you know, well, not too long ago, you were sitting in these chairs. You were a student at Wilfrid Laurier University. Uh, you were a football player for the Laurier Golden Hawks. And you were thinking about your own career. And here we sit with you, the Dean of Canadian Diplomats. What happened in between? How did you get from? Pure serendipity. <laughs> Pure serendipity. <laughs> Tell us a little bit more about that. Uh, first of all, I want to uh, thank Terry for that uh, introduction. And uh, it's the nicest introduction, uh, together with yours last night, I've ever had for somebody who didn't work for me. <laughs> uh, I was born in Kitchener and raised in Waterloo. Uh, I lived on Union Street, not very far from here. Virtually everything I can see here is familiar to me. From my, I used to play hockey. Oh, that's bad. Can you hear me? It's OK. If I do that, it gets a lot louder. <laughs> Over there, I used to play hockey in what used to be the Waterloo Arena is now Perimeter Institute. For some reason, they thought they should upgrade. <laughs> I'm not sure the, the arena is now further over. I was, um, it's true, I, I got an honorary doctorate uh, at, at Laurier, uh, and uh, they had a lunch for me. And, so, and they invited a couple of my old professors there. And one of them stood up and, and said, um, you know, Paul, it's at this point in the pr proceedings where I'm supposed to recall what a great student you were. But frankly, I can't remember you at all, he said. <laughs> <laughs> and I, uh, I thought, well, that's, you know, I'm not sure I can remember you either. Uh, <laughs> so I guess we made a big impression on each other. Uh, I was called in by the dean of students. I, I shouldn't say all this, but I'm saying it anyway. I want to show you how much times have changed. And I certainly don't, don't recommend my own behavior. I was called in by the Dean of Students because I had played on the Laurier football team, or the WLU football team, and the hockey team, and the basketball team, and the track team, and I played football for the local Kitchener team. And the Dean of Students said, Paul, you've shown us you can be an athlete. We were wondering if you could be a student, too. <laughs> <laughs> and that was a bit of a wake-up call. Uh, and that together with the, the influence of my mother. Uh, and also I played for the Waterloo junior hockey team as well. Anyway, leaving all that aside, um, uh, one day after football practice, in a very cold, wet day, on, uh, and the football field used to, the practice field used to be about where the uh, alumni house is now at, at Laureate. And uh, it was cold and it was wet and it was too cold and wet to walk down University Avenue to the bus stop to go home. Uh, and I saw a sign on the bulletin board that said foreign service exam. So I wrote it with, uh, with no preparation, no forethought, no afterthought either. Uh, and I passed it. Uh, and then, because I had always thought I was going to be a football player, and I got a, and one day in the spring I got a letter from Foreign Affairs and a letter from uh, the Edmonton Eskimos on the same day, one drafting me to play football and one offering me a job in the Foreign Service. And I thought for it a, about it a bit, and I remembered the, uh, the football field in Edmonton, I'm watching it on television. It was always, you know, in October, November, it was always kind of, the field was frozen solid. There was snow everywhere. And I thought to myself, hmm, Foreign Service sounds like a bit like the Foreign Legion. Foreign Legion, that means deserts. <laughs> warm. <laughs> Sorry, warm, <laughs> warm, warm temperatures, some kind of uh, exotic stuff going on. So 
So I picked the Foreign Service, that plus the fact that it paid more to be in the Foreign Service in those days, and it paid to play football. When I was, I was sort of, what's the word I'm looking for? Hamilton expressed an interest, Hamilton Tiger Cats, because this was the area that belonged to Hamilton also. And the way you got paid was you got a job in Stelco in the steel mill, and you got a little bit of extra money. And I didn't, you know, I could see these guys pouring the steel and the, it's all molten and wearing, oh, I, I thought, I don't think I want to do that. <laughs> so I didn't play, I didn't play football. I was called into the personnel division after a while. And uh, they said, uh, how would you like to go to Ankara? And I said, I'd love to go to Ankara. And I went back to my office and I got out the, the, uh, the, the atlas and looked up where Ankara was because I wasn't actually sure. I thought it might be in Turkey, but I wasn't really sure where it was. And then I got some books out of the library and saw that it was a place that had no trees. And desert, I thought, the desert of the foreign language. <laughs> That's right, I got it. I, I got, Closer I got, than you imagined. I got it. I got what I was looking for. Anyway, to make a long story short, that ended up, I worked for the next 38 years, and that's how I got to where I, uh, where I got to be ambassador. <laughs> so other than, than writing the Foreign <laughs> Service exam, which we yeah. know is still the same for these folks, yeah. what else is the same? What did they face in trying to enter the Foreign Service here in 2010? Oh, it's tough. Um, last, the last time there was an they wrote, I don't even think there's an exam to write this year because they're so broke. The last time that they had the exam, was the year before. There were 10,000 people who wrote it and 100 got job offers. That's 1%. And it's preposterous to think that there's any exam that can grade people so finely that they can figure out who the top 1% is. So it's a bit of a lottery. I'm sorry to say that. I don't want to disappoint anybody. But uh, I also tell my students that they shouldn't be jumping off buildings if they don't get accepted into the Foreign Service because it is a lottery. You, know, you have almost as much chance going across to the shopping center and buying a Lotto 649 ticket as getting into the Foreign Service. It's not quite that bad. And obviously, the more prepared you are, the better. But it's, it's really difficult, and it's, and it's difficult in a way that's unfair. You can't, you know, if, if afterwards you could say, well, OK, best people got in. I'm very, you know, wasn't me, but I can understand. You can't say that. You, you know that there's going to be mistakes in that hundred. And uh, so, so it can be quite disappointing for people. On the other hand, it's the most interesting of careers. I don't think, uh, you know, there may be other places where you can have uh, as much fun, but I can't think of many. You know, here I am all these years later, and I'm, you know, I'm dying to read the newspaper in the morning. I want to know what's going on. I, f I want to, you know, I'd love to be helping this government not be so hopeless, uh, which would be easy, actually, to do, because uh, you could start anywhere. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, but I want, uh, what I do say is that, you know, I want to say a word about them, because you're, you are going to be better educated, you're going to have more experience, you're going to be better able to do this kind of job than we, we were. Part of the reason I wanted to tell you that, I mean, when I, when I wrote the Foreign Service exam, we had no, it, you know, the idea of competition, I mean, it was, it was very competitive in the Foreign Service exam, but we didn't worry about a career. We were going to have a career. We were going to have some kind of a career. We didn't, uh, we weren't worried about our future at all. The, the times have changed so much. You really have to be cracking the books. You really have to be working. You really have to be able to, to get your foot in the door is a lot more difficult now than it was in my time. Do you have any advice on how to do it? Is it a question of networking, taking advantage of extracurricular? Um, uh, yes, not ne networking. Uh, who you know is not going to help you with the foreign service. Uh, you can you can know Stephen Harper, and it wouldn't help you pass the foreign service. You really have to. I mean, that really is. That, but there's another way into the foreign service, uh, and that is uh, where networking can help you, and that is. There are not enough people in the Foreign Service to do the jobs that exist in Ottawa and abroad. So they're, what they're doing is hiring people. They hire them temporarily, and then they get contracts, and then they get, then they get uh, sort of they get some, some into the government in some way. 
they get into the Department of Foreign Affairs, they do the job, and the system says, well, this person can do the job. And so they get hired as Foreign Service officers. They don't do that very often, but they do it periodically. And that's, you know, that in some ways is a better way for most people. The reason why they stick with a Foreign Service exam is it's not fair for somebody living in Victoria or St. John's, Newfoundland, because it's hard for them to get in the back door. So you've got to keep the front door open for people like that. And that's probably an important distinction, that getting into the Foreign Service is very difficult, but getting into the government yeah. is not necessarily as difficult. It's not as difficult, and it hasn't been as difficult even through the recession. Uh, one of the things that they've discovered is that the stimulus money the government's been spending has been having its major impact in Ottawa. Mm -hmm. There have been more jobs created in Ottawa than there have been any place else, which is kind of perverse, but we always do that because we're spending the money. Yeah. Right. There are a couple of things that I'd, I'd love to cover with you, yeah. um, Paul, before we open it up. One is, is just sticking with this, your experience, the, mm -hmm. the, the insider's view. What is it like to be in an embassy? What is your average day? When you were ambassador to Germany, what was your average day? Well, to give you two average days, an average day is an ambassador, an average day is a third secretary. The average day of the third secretary would begin worrying about what the ambassador was going to ask you. Uh, I, was, uh, I was the most junior of junior people and, and, and posted to our embassy was the most brilliant of ambassadors, uh, probably in the Canadian public service. And every day was a terrifying day because every day was uh, he was going to ask me a question I didn't know the answer to mm -hmm. and he was going to imply that if I was worth anything I should have known the answer to that question. And uh, ba basically, I got a doctorate in uh, international relations in three years serving in the Canadian Embassy in Ankara because every day I had to write, I had to talk to people, I had to do the analysis, I had to do the research, I had to do everything. I, one of the most interesting, I, I did um, visas. This is a small embassy, it's a, it's a little more specialized now. I did visas, I did, uh, I did refugees. I, I did some of the commercial work. On visas, I used to say to the, we had a, we had a receptionist, I would say, if a beautiful girl walks in and wants a visa, I will interview her. <laughs> <laughs> and I did. <laughs> right, you know, why, why not? If somebody had to. These are the perks of the job. <laughs> you know, what else? Uh, it must be something I get from this. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> I was, also the, I was also the refugee officer on a very interesting experience, two actually. Um, one interesting experience uh, was that uh, in 1969 when they had the Velvet Revolution and, uh, and, the, and, the, and the Soviet Union reinvaded Czechoslovakia, which was way before you were either born or cognizant of it at least, um, there, was a, uh, there was a man at the Czech embassy and the day after the invasion, there was a reception at the Romanian embassy for a lot of diplomats. And this man was at the Romanian embassy. And the Russian ambassador reached out to shake his hand, and the guy put his hand behind his back. The Czech did. Wouldn't shake hands with the Russian ambassador. In about two days, he got a recall notice uh, from. And he came to me, and he said, they're, you know, they're, they're trying to get, you know, get me back. Uh, so he stayed in my apartment. I let him stay in my apartment. These days, you'd probably get fired for doing that, but I let him stay in my apartment. He kept going to the office, but he stayed with me so that nothing could happen to him at night. I went to a, a, a moving company that I knew because they moved our stuff. And I said, move that man's stuff to Ottawa. You know, don't send it to Czechoslovakia. Pack it all up. Instead of sending it to Prague, sending it, send it to Ottawa. So we got the Czech government to pay the moving costs of his of his goods back to Ottawa, and we got, got in touch with Ottawa, and we got him accepted as a refugee. Mm -hmm. that, was, uh, that was a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. I had one other case, you know, when you talk about uh, diplomats or people who are sent to lie abroad for their country. Um, I had a British next door neighbor, and he told me about some case of a guy that they had on their hands that they didn't know what to do with. He was a, a Romanian, uh, and that, um, and that he was a drug addict, but you know he had some connection with the British government. Next thing I know, we get a request from the British that we should, I should interview this guy for a visa. He came through Ottawa, 
they had basically lied to, to Ottawa. And uh, I said, that's the same name, it's the same guy. So I interviewed him and I kept asking him, do you take drugs? Do you have a drug problem? Have you ever taken drugs? He kept avoiding the question over and over again. So I concluded that you know this guy was lying to us. And that's what I said to Ottawa. Ottawa, in its wisdom, accepted it anyway. My next door neighbor, I said to him, I said, remember that guy you told me about? He said, well, you know, you've managed to unload him on us. He said, I never told you that. Straight to my face, he told me what he, that what he told me two weeks earlier, he had never said. Can you imagine that? I can imagine. <laughs> I can imagine. It's not that much of a stretch, perhaps. Uh, the, the denouement of this story is that there was a, there was a I, I have a little press clipping from about a year ago. He was arrested in Toronto for uh, sexual harassment of one of the people he worked with. <laughs> so so the, the, things we get up, the things we get up to in order to exchange intelligence with the British and some of the favors we do are really quite dumb. In my so the day-to-day -day when you're working abroad for the government can bring the, the, a whole variety of the day experiences. day-to-day is very, very uh, in the, uh, of a junior officer is very much in the valleys. You're not really working on, you know, the reform of the United Nations or the, you know, relations between East and West or North and South. You're basically dealing with, you know, people who, who are getting into trouble or are causing trouble or you know, helping Canadian businesses or whatever you're doing. It's, it's very different kind of, uh, it's, not, it's not nearly so glamorous, but, uh, but it's fun. Every day is different. And important. What about the day-to-day -day at the UN? I mean, we know uh, on the public record, of course, that you did have some very exciting experiences there. We know you sat in the Security Council when Colin Powell presented the case for Iraq, mm -hmm. among other things. But were those the peaks, and there are valleys at the UN, or is the UN all about peaks? The UN, uh, if you're the ambassador, it's almost all about peaks. Mm -hmm. uh, you get the odd valley, but not very many. Uh, I, I was in the council when the Americans made their case to go to war in Iraq. And I listened to Colin Powell, and I couldn't believe what I was hearing. It was BS from beginning to end. This was the Secretary of State of the United States at the Security Council, the most important security location in the country or, or in the world, talking about peace and security, and he was giving us a load of stuff. And I just thought to myself, how can this, you know, am I hearing what I'm hearing? Because I had access, like everybody in New York had access, to the uh, reports of the weapons inspectors. You, you, you knew what they had been finding. And basically, they hadn't been finding anything. They had looked and looked and looked and looked. Over the years, they had accounted for every Scud missile but one. They had accounted for virtually every, uh, all of the uh, chemical weapons precursors. The way they do these things is they, they check the, the import records and the production records of certain chemicals. From that, you can deduct how much of a chemical weapon might, could have been made. And they were able to clear up almost the whole thing. The only thing that there was any serious doubt left about was the biological weapons because they're relatively easier to make and it, it takes less space to do it. And, uh, but even there, there the, the weapons inspectors were not finding anything. And I spoke to the, man, the chief weapons inspector and I said, what's happening? And he said, we've asked the Americans and the British for their best intelligence uh, and we go to those places and we don't find anything. He was threatened by the White House with discrediting that they would discredit him if he said there were no weapons of mass destruction. It was, it was really brutal stuff, and he did. The head of the, of the UN uh, International Atomic Energy Agency came into the Security Council and said that they were all but certain that there were no nuclear weapons. All but certain. It didn't stop you know, by all but certain, it meant they've been looking and 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 never finding anything. The U.S. president gave a State of the Union speech in which he talked about uh, a precursor ingredient, yellow cake, uranium, that was being, had been purchased in Niger, in Africa, he said, and was, be, was destined for a, the, a, a nuclear weapons program. It took the IAEA one day, that's all, to prove it was a forgery. One day. But it took the U.S. government with the CIA and the National Security 
the Department of Defense, they couldn't figure that out. So you were the last person to represent us on the Security Council. I was the last person who may ever represent Canada on the Security there may, Council. There won't be somebody in this round. We'll hope that there will be in future rounds. Tell us why we lost that seat. We lost that seat for two reasons. First reason is that the Canadian government is not interested enough in foreign policy. It ha it's manifestly, it made that manifest over the years. Prime Minister skipped the general debate last year to go to an opening of the Tim Hortons uh, announcement. I, you know, I, and I know that the Canadians care more about Tim Hortons than they care about the UN. But he could have, you know, it isn't every day that a prime minister shows up for such an announcement. It was an important announcement that the ownership of Tim Hortons was coming back to Canada. But, you know, maybe they could have had it the day before or the day after the general debate. It didn't have to coincide exactly with the general debate. And people in New York saw that. They said, you know, this guy's not interested. Louise Frechette, who works here, wrote an article in a book that we had uh, published uh, together with Carleton University called uh, Canada Among Nations. And this particular volume was about as others see us. And we had Louise write because she's sort of an other as having been Deputy Secretary General. And she talked about the reticence of the Canadian government towards the UN and the tendency to sit in judgment rather than to participate. We asked, we asked a number of foreigners to give us a view on Canadian foreign policy. And we asked people who knew us well enough that their views would be you know, valid and who were important enough that their opinions should matter to us. And the consequence of that was that there, there was, a, there was a, a near consensus that Canada had disappeared from the international scene. Canada has withdrawn. The question in one of the essays was, where has Canada gone? That was the title. So the Canadian government just was not interested in international relations. The prime minister had never been out of North America before he was elected. Um, he, President Reagan went to, uh, went to the UN for the general debate every year he was in office. President George H.W. Bush went every year he was in office. President Clinton went every year he was in office. President George W. Bush went every year he was in office. Barack Obama, President Barack Obama, has gone every year since he's been in office, and sometimes more than once. And we were able to blow it off as not important. We, 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 I want to come back to the question about whether the UN is important. So I'll try to describe now what happened. So, you know, foreign policy under this government, as I say in this wonderful book that you really, my publicist said every five or ten minutes you need to mention the book. <laughs> so that people, it'll be a few minutes again till the, <laughs> the next time. Um, uh, the, under Trudeau and under Pearson, people who'd sort of established some of the principles of Canadian foreign policy. The idea was foreign policy is the extension abroad of national policy. That was Trudeau. Pearson said foreign policy is just domestic policy with its hat on. Same idea, a little bit more colorful. Under this government, it's the importation of foreign issues for domestic benefit. Everything is run through the, through the prism of how does this work politically, partisanly, in Canada. And they're, so, you know, they play wedge politics with the Arab-Israeli issue, the, the Armenians and the Turks, the Taiwanese and the Chinese. All of this stuff, very dangerous, uh, not the slightest bit principled, by the way. Uh, and uh, that, that's, that's the way it works. That kind of stuff is noticed. We have 150 embassies in Ottawa. You know, they're not blind and they're not deaf. They see what's going on. Uh, we've been very bad at managing relationships. It took the government four years to, to, to have a visit to China. And we, it was a visit that we should pay because there's a, you know, a kind of exchange. It was our turn. Four years. It took almost as long, well, it took as long, although they started a little bit more earlier with India to try to recognize, beginning to recognize the significance of India. Relationship with, relations with Brazil are so bad uh, that the Brazilian government was actually one of the governments that's said to have been leading the opposition to Canada getting onto the Security Council. 
I, that's one of those things that I find kind of puzzling because it's been bad for some time. It's got it's to do with Bombardier. Yeah. Bombardier and Embraer are a big part of it. But they also find us as being, as being kind of superior and kind of, you know, very satisfied with ourselves and it grates on them a lot. Anyway. Why you know, should we care about that? Why should we care? Can, I, can I finish? Can, yeah, I want to come back to it. I want, I want to finish why we lost because I'm only getting started on okay. that. Okay. <laughs> we'll so in. relationships. Mexico. We imposed a visa obligation on Mexican citizens to visit Canada at the beginning of the tourist season, and we had no infrastructure in place in Mexico to hand out visas. We lost hundreds of millions of dollars, the travel industry did, from that decision because people weren't able to come. And we really irritated people. And we are still really irritating people. There was last week at CG10, or the week before, whenever that was, there was a Mexican diplomat there who had been granted a single entry visa to Canada. Because you never know, this Mexican diplomat was, might have been a candidate for refugee status. He had to show how much money he had in the bank, what other holdings he had, where he lived, whether he rented or owned. He had to put down his mother and father's name and address. I think what their holdings were. He had to have a ticket that was a return ticket. He had to go through hoops to come to Canada to accept our invitation to contribute to something we wanted to hear him on. Can you imagine? There's an, in the same book about Canada Among Nations, How Others See Us, there's an article by Andreas Rosenthal, who's a Mexican. He begins by saying Canada is one of the, and it probably isn't true anymore, but was when he wrote it, Canada is one of the Mexico's favorite countries. Period. Should it be? Question mark. And then he went on for the <laughs> to lay out the case why it shouldn't be. Um, so that's relationships. Then there's policies. What have we done on policy? Well, uh, climate change. If you're a small island state in the Pacific, you would like a country that's contributing significantly to the uh, uh, carbon dioxide in the air, carbon gases, greenhouse gases into the air. You would like them to take that seriously because you're the you know, the water's rising, uh, and you don't have any place else to go. There are 20 of those or so of small island states, maybe even more. Then if you take into account um, uh, the African countries who are worried about Sahel and the desertification of the area around there and other incidences of climate extremes, you know, floods in Mozambique and stuff, and Canada is not taking its obligation seriously. We had negotiated the Kyoto Accord. I negotiated the Kyoto Accord. We ratified the accord. The Liberal government did, didn't implement it. And the Conservative government basically rejected it and left the impression it doesn't believe in climate change at all. You know, ever hear the prime, prime Minister talking about climate change? So uh, climate change is a, is a problem. And our performance at Copenhagen, where we, where we got the Fossil of the Year Award, uh, you know, I don't put a whole lot of credit in that, but it, the point was that they, the international community was not impressed with our positions. Then you go to uh, uh, the aid program. We announced very publicly that we were shifting the focus of our aid program from Africa to Latin America. So we, we, we very publicly downgraded the Africans. The government did maintain its, uh, pro the promise of the previous government to double aid to Africa and, it, and was either has done it or is on track to do it. I'm not quite sure. I get two of these programs mixed up. We d they did bring in the maternal health uh, program, which is going to have a, a, a disproportionate benefit in Africa. And they get, did get tangled up on the, the issue of reproductive health services, which is to say abortion and birth control. Uh, and got publicly rebuked for it by, by uh, Mrs. Clinton. By the way, in case you think it's normal that a U.S. Secretary of State comes to Canada and gives the Canadian government hell in public three times in three days, I have never seen it ever happen in my life before this spring. She did it on the Arctic. She did it on this issue. And she did it on another issue. I don't know what the other one is was. Is that our policy or is that her style? I think it's our policy. I think that, you know, she, got, she was asked, in her, she was asked straight out at a press conference, you know, whether she agreed with our policy on, on uh, 
maternal health. And our policy is George W. Bush's policy. And she had fought that policy for years, and she just said so. So I, but I, you know, had she said to me, if I had been the, the, the Canadian Secretary of State or foreign, foreign Minister, I should say, and she had told me that how to run uh, our, our conference on the Arctic, I'd have told her to get lost in public because it's none of her damn business. If she didn't like it, she didn't have to come. We don't need any lectures from her. But the point is, you know, three separate things uh, were, were not going well. It's, it is said also at the UN that we lost because the Americans didn't support us. The American ambassador is married to a Canadian. She knows Canadian foreign policy intimately. And she is said to have told her staff, don't interfere. Don't help the Canadians. Just stand aside and let it, let it happen whatever is going to happen. Uh, I think it's probably true. Did the United Arab Emirates have anything to do with undoubtedly it? Undoubtedly, the United Arab Emirates problem. Uh, we allowed this problem to develop. We could see it coming for months. We, we didn't deal with it. We didn't respond. We seemed to take the view that it would somehow go away or that they, they were asking for something that they shouldn't be asking for and that there wouldn't be any consequences. One of the things about the government that I do, really don't understand is that is it seeming presumption that your decisions don't have consequences. They thought they could do all of these things and there would be no consequences. And some of us were saying, you know, you're trying to get elected. You know, this is not a time to be poking fingers in people's eyes. Well, what is the consequence of this, Paul? What have we lost? You still, we're still figuring we're out still, why we lost uh, the seed. Okay. You no, know, because it's important. You tell me. Okay, climate change, the African policy, yeah. the Middle East policy. Middle East policy, we have become perceived as being unfair. We have come to be seen as buying the Israeli narrative and rejecting the Palestinian narrative, both of which are not, I mean, they're not perfectly compatible, as you can imagine. But we had a reputation in the Middle East, despite the fact that from day one we supported Israel's right to exist in security uh, you know, in the Middle East. Um, that is fundamental bedrock Canadian policy since 1948. And it's never, no, no Canadian government has ever wavered on that. This Canadian government decided that it had to be much more publicly supportive of the Israelis. And it presented it as principle that we were, we were carrying out a principled foreign policy, which suggests two things. Other people's foreign policies are not principled. And, uh, and the second thing is that, uh, you know, the, anybody who criticizes us is doing it for n ignoble reasons. And the Arabs say, international humanitarian law, you're ignoring international humanitarian law, you're ignoring international law, you're keeping your mouth shut on settlements. You're not saying anything about where the wall is being built on Palestinian territory. And you think you're principled. You know, and the whole notion was because Israel is a democracy, it's like us. But, you know, it's not as though democracies can't do things. You know, Hitler, I don't, I don't want to make a comparison there. Let's take the Americans. The Americans uh, rendered Canadians to Syria to be tortured. The world's greatest democracy was complicit in the torture of Canadians. So if you really think, you know, Guantanamo, Abu, Abu Ghraib, Bagram, the idea that a democracy can do no wrong is just not, it's just not correct. Democracies can do plenty of things just that you have a better chance of correcting them probably afterwards because you can vote for somebody else. Long and short of it is that we created, we followed policies that were perceived no longer to be fair. Previous Canadian governments worked very hard at being fair on the Middle East while supporting Israel. This one gave up, you know, gave up the idea of fairness or interpreted it in such a way that nobody else thought it was being fair. We add all that up together. Let's see now. There are about, I think, plus or minus 20 small island states, 53 African states, 57 Islamic and Arabic states. You've got to get 128 out of 192. You subtract all that, you can't win. Now, you're not going to lose all of those votes. We didn't lose every vote. But what was really telling, and now come back to why it's important, 
what was really telling was the vote total. The first vote total was Germany, only 128, by the way, not a very strong showing. We, could, we would have beaten them in 1998. We had 131 votes. Okay. Second place was Portugal at 122, Canada at 114. So we're forced into a second round. You've got to get 128 votes, and the Germans just made it. Second round, Portugal 113, so they're losing some altitude. Canada 76. We lost 38 votes. In, and the next round was, was going to be further dissent. Why is that? Well, we had been campaigning since about 2002 or 2003 for the next Security Council election. We had been exchanging commitments. You vote for us on the Security Council, we vote for you on the Security Council. And a number of other commissions and committees and things where people wanted things. We banked a lot of commitments. Those commitments hold for the first round by convention. People keep their word by and large. They are, there's always a certain percentage of liars, and there, and there was this time as well. Second round, you're not bound anymore by those commitments. And when they were not bound by the commitments, our support just hit, just went on the down escalator. It was really striking. I've never seen anything like that. That means that freed from commitments, their judgment of Canadian foreign policy was even more negative than we thought it would. That's how we lost. Now, does it matter? Well, <laughs> why do we care? You know, the facetious question, I suppose, is why do we care? Because I take your point on the Middle East, but on something like climate change, we have very specific domestic interests that have to do with the tar sands, and we may choose as a country to promote them over international climate change. Now, there may be a consequence in international fora, but should that drive our policy? Let's, let's compare our policy to that of George W. Bush's by way of answer. George W. Bush uh, backed out of the cl climate change agreement reached by a previous predecessor by saying it would have an economic impact in the United States. As though it were not going to have an economic impact in Europe, it wasn't going to have an economic impact in Japan, it wasn't going to have an economic impact everywhere else that people were doing things. It is irresponsible in the extreme to say, we have an economic interest, and you will understand that we've got to protect this interest. It's too bad about, you know, you better lift your feet up because the water is getting deeper there. Uh, you, you know, it, it is, you cannot be a responsible international citizen and say, our economic interests prevail. If it's costly to you, that's too bad. So what have we got on, on tar sands? Have we, try, have we done the best anybody could do in, in controlling the emissions on the tar, tar sands? Is anybody, is, are we walking around with that kind of reputation that, that we're world beaters in this area? I don't think so. We've, been, we've, we've said we were going to invest about $2 billion, $2 billion on, on carbon uh, capture and storage, which might work. We don't know that it's going to work. But that's what we're doing. And when you, when you want to get a defense of what we're doing, that's what we're doing. Some of the technology has improved, undoubtedly, with injecting water and steam into the tar sands and getting the, the stuff to come out. But we, we're not, we have basically taken the view that this matters a lot to us, and therefore you, all, you should all understand. The Japanese, who are much more energy efficient than we are, are asked to understand why it is that we, we don't have to do this. But of course, it's appropriate for them to go ahead and do it. And the same thing if you're if you're uh, if you're uh, Europeans, and you have you know gasoline at five dollars uh, a liter, or is it a liter now or a gallon? Anyway, a liter I think in some places. But you know, but you understand that politically, that's difficult for us to do. It's easy for you to pay five dollars a liter, but for us, we'll stick at a dollar because you know. It's, it's so difficult for us. We're, like, we're just being irresponsible. And the world sees that we're being irresponsible. And the idea that we, should, that we should get a dispensation because we have an economic issue. Where we might get some credit is the notion that we're supplying clean energy to the United States. Uh, because by the time it gets there, it's cleaner. You know, we've absorbed some of the production, uh, the dirty production. You know, I could imagine writing that into some kind of a treaty. Some, it's a very complicated story, but probably you know, may not be beyond wit. But the idea is that uh, you know, it's, uh, everybody should understand that this is hard for us. You know. So what if, what if 
capacity loss, where will we see tangibly consequences of this loss in our yeah. experience in the next couple of years? Well, the, the, the council matters for, the, for a variety of reasons. The UN Charter is the rule book of international relations. The UN is a central operating system. You cannot, uh, you, you have to, um, that's the burden. Every country, all 192 countries, have signed that treaty and are abiding by it. The UN Charter stigmatizes aggression. Part of the reason that the Americans had such a hard time in Iraq, you could have said, well, you know, Germans invaded France, right? Uh, so the Americans have invaded in Iraq. Who cares? Well, what's happened in between was we lost 60 million people, or 30 million people. Let me get the numbers right. We lost 10 million people in the First World War. We lost 30 million people in the Second World War. And we decided losing that many people was not a good idea, and we needed some rules. One of the rules was only wars would, be, wars would only be allowed if they were approved by the UN Security Council. The UN created rules to keep people from slaughtering each other. If you take the view that it doesn't matter, then basically you're leaving aside the morality of it. It means you really fundamentally don't understand. A country like Canada needs those rules a lot more than a country like the United States needs those rules. The United States is big enough to look after itself. And by the way, if you like your independence, the United States is big enough to look after us, too. But that isn't necessarily going to be good for us. Um, the Security Council is the place where the Americans went to get authorization after 9-11 to carry out military operations against Afghanistan. The Security Council is the place that we went in 2003 to get authorization. And they went to the Council to get authorization to fight in Iraq, mostly under pressure from the British, but they nonetheless did it. So, and they were denied that uh, sanction, or that, that uh, permission. 2006, the Israelis and the Palestinians brought, the, brought their war to the Security Council for it to be resolved. They couldn't, re they couldn't resolve it on their own, and the Security Council did that. Now the Security Council is the place where we're coordinating response to the, uh, to the Iranian nuclear weapons program. It's a place that has the authority to pass, impose sanctions on Iran as well. It's a place which passes the rule, basically has passed the rules on, on cooperating with terrorists. There have been 13 UN anti-terrorist anti conventions, and the UN Security Council has, has basically legislated, which is, all, in other words, the decision of the Security Council is binding on Canada, even if Canada is not there, even if Canada disagrees with it, it's binding. And it made, the decision, it made the decision that no country would allow its financial systems to be open to the, to, uh, the use of terrorists. And it created the no-fly list, which has caused some Canadians so much trouble. And we were not present there. This is the place where the world's most important security questions come to be dealt with. It isn't a pocketbook issue. Not everything can be reduced to dollars and cents. And, you know. So Canadians who say, I wake up this morning and I'm not poorer, so what do I care? They're, they're poorer in a different way. Um, we care a lot we, uh, you know, in how the Security Council is to be reformed. And people are saying, oh, it's the UN reform. They talk about it endlessly. They never achieve it. Part of the reason they don't achieve reform in the Security Council is that there are genuine disagreements. And that we're one of the leaders, by the way, in the disagreement. We do not want the Security Council to, uh, to be modified in a way that prejudices our interests. We don't have a permanent seat on the Security Council. Now we have Japan paying 20, 19% of the budget, Germany paying 9% of the budget, Brazil, India paying much less than we do, by the way, South Africa, Nigeria. They all want permanent seats on the Security Council. They get permanent seats on the Security Council. We are permanent third-class citizens. And so what we're saying is, all right, if you, want to, if you want to reflect the current realities, sure, the world doesn't look like it looked like in 1945. If you were picking permanent members now, you probably wouldn't put, pick both Britain and France. You might pick the European Union. You might even pick Germany. Uh, all right, we'll, you know, we have to reflect the changes. You know, Brazil matters, India matters, Nigeria matters, South Africa matters, Japan and Germany matter. Right. 
well, let's let them be elected. Let's give them term. Let's give them five-year terms or seven-year terms. But let's ask them to present themselves regularly to be elected. And if the membership wants to elect them, then you know, if membership agrees that they're that important, then they'll be elected. And if the membership disagrees, as in the case of some other countries we can think of, then they won't be elected. <laughs> so, the, but the idea that this doesn't matter, the other thing that really troubles me, it, because this is, right now you're hearing the right-wing backlash, if I can put it that way. You're hearing about the UN is corrupt, a bunch of dictators, and what do we care what they think? How many democracies do you think there are in the UN? 116. How many members are there? 192. How many countries, this is according to Freedom House, how, how many countries are described as free or, or at least partly free? 150 of the 192 countries. How many votes did we get? 114. How many democracies are there? 116. Hmm. We didn't even get all the democracies votes. When we got 76 votes, or whatever it was, you can be sure we'd lost a whole bunch more democracy votes. It, is, it isn't the case that the tyrants are running the place. The United States has been running the, the UN since about 1945. The country with the most sway in the UN has always been the United States. And it still is. So the idea that this is dominated by, well, you know, turn the question back on these right-wingers. Do you think the United States is a tin pot dictatorship? Well, in that case, uh, then the accusation is incorrect because it's the United States which dominates. Does the UN do everything right? No. The UN is member country. It's, you know, Secretary General like the Prime Minister? Is that sort of what he is, kind of Prime Minister? No. Secretary General is like a Deputy Minister. Secretary General is like the steward of a club. Secretary General can't send forces anywhere on his own. He can't tell the Americans what to do. He can't tell the Canadians what to do. He can't, he can't tell Sierra Leone what to do. He can't tell anybody what to do, basically. He is the servant of the membership. So what, when you end up in those circumstances, and people say, well, the UN is not acting. Well, the UN is not an independent entity. The UN is, is, is the collective will of the international community. And when it disagrees with itself, nothing happens. Disagreed on, on Sudan disagrees now, sort of, on Congo, can't bring itself to deal with Congo effectively. It isn't because, you know, that there's some moral shortcoming in the UN, although there's some, you know, responsibility to protect. There were, there were a lot of permanent representatives living in the Upper East Side of Manhattan who had forgotten what it's like to be being abused by their own government. But generally speaking, you know, the UN is, is central, now, the, the final point, they're gonna, if they're, we now have a situation in which virtually all of the aspirants, I think, except Japan, is on the Security Council, and they're in part of the G20. If the time was ever right for a reform of the, of the Security Council, this is it. And guess what? We're not there. We have interests. We have interests that are not like the Americans' interests, and not like the British interests, and not like the Brazilian, or the Indian, or the... Japanese and German, we have different interests, and we're not going to be there to promote our interests and to protect them. So it's a loss for us. I don't want to abuse the privilege of being yeah. the only questioner here, so why don't we open this up and uh, see if folks in the audience have some questions that they want to pose to Mr. Heindecker. I believe there is a microphone, uh, or is there not? No, we'll repeat. So if you ask your question, we might repeat it, and we're just doing that for the sake of the, uh, the broadcast. <laughs> So if you just want to put up your hand, if you have a question, please let us know. Don't be shy. Don't be shy. Go ahead. Yeah, it's really worth it. <laughs> well, to my mind, the, the most important thing is we have to take our international role seriously again, because we haven't been. We, we really... What we've done is we have greatly strengthened, we have carried out one major, major though, one major foreign policy issue, Afghanistan. We've, we've invested a lot of aid money in Afghanistan, more there than we have anywhere else in the world. We've, we've had our soldiers there in you know, large numbers. We've lost, tragically, 150 plus 
I'm not sure where we stand exactly, but it's not trivial. Uh, but that's basically been it. And, and one of the things that we've done is we have upgraded, partly because of Afghanistan, partly for ideological reasons, but we've upgraded the military substantially. Military expenditures are, well, are, are, are more than double, are, are approaching triple what they were two or three, three or four years ago. At the same time as we're doing that, and some of that's really necessary because the military had been allowed to run down. I would not be for one second making the argument that the military was fine and that this was just silly. Uh, you know, if you want, if you believe in the responsibility to protect, which is a Canadian idea, you got to have a military that can protect people. You can't, you can't do that by sending diplomatic notes to, you know, to tyrants and saying you, know, you have to make nice with those people that you're decimating now. Uh, so you need, you need that. But what accompanied that was a decision to freeze our aid program and, an, and, and, and a series of decisions to reduce our diplomacy. Our diplomacy particularly is down $188 million in five years. I mean, the diplomacy that is the core diplomacy, this, this normal stuff that embassies do. So you're, you're really making bureaucrats out of your diplomats. They've got no money to see the country. They've got no money to get to know people. One of the, one of the, it's a force multiplier the way communications is a force multiplier for the military. You go to a country, you've got two or three or four years to create a network of people that can be helpful to Canada either right away or prospectively. You try to build relationships so that when trouble comes, you've got somebody to turn to. Or when an interest arises, you've got somebody to help you achieve it. If you have no money and you're sitting in your office, you might as well be sitting in your office in Ottawa. You can't, you don't make any relationships. You don't make any contacts. You just sit there doing nine to five. Nine to five doesn't cut it in diplomacy. So that's the place to start to get back in the game is to start spending, is to start reinvesting in diplomacy. There's no question about that in my mind. What else can you do? You can take the UN more seriously. That will be difficult for this government to do, I think, you know, in the circumstances. But I think that that's the lesson that we want to, the next thing we should do is to sit down and do a lessons learned exercise. Anytime you've had a big success or a big failure, you should sit down and figure out what happened. Why did, why did we fail so badly? I've just given you, uh, you know, about half an hour's worth of my own opinion of that, but I think it's a fairly well-informed opinion. But you need to figure out why did we lose support so dramatically. And then the next thing is, should we do something about it? I mean, are we right? Were we right and was everybody else wrong? That, that was a Margaret Thatcher approach to foreign relations. Or, you know, some of what we've done, a mistake on our part or a problem on our part or, or something. And draw the, con draw the conclusions. But I, that's very tough to do. In Politics. I don't know whether that will that will be possible or not. But uh, clearly, uh, the thing to do now is to say to yourself, "Well, at the UN, there's a lot going on besides the Security Council, so we should start. You know, we should upgrade our our participation in a lot of those other things." I just I just wanted to give you some numbers, which I meant to do before about. What the UN, the UN does a lot more in the field than it ever used to do. Let me, where, where are the numbers? They're over here someplace. Yes. The World Food Program last year fed how many people? 102 million people. So there's, you know, 102 million people are eating because of the UN. The UN High Commissioner for Refugees gave... Uh, gave uh, refuge uh, to how many people? 32 million people. Almost the population of Canada are being given, are giving refuge. Thanks to the UN, polio is almost, thanks to the UN and the Rotary Club, which is an interesting combination, the, U, you know, the world is almost free of polio. You know, there's still, there's still bits of it in India and still bits, and I think in Afghanistan and still some in in Nigeria, but it's nearly gone. There's, they've, been, they've, they've been giving vaccines to, to kids for you know, 
measles. They've saved millions and millions and millions of lives. They, there's an international criminal justice system now that never used to exist before. International criminal court, the court for Yugoslavia, the court for Rwanda, court for Sierra Leone, court for Cambodia. All of that stuff is not in the charter, never existed before, but it's all very important. Environment treaties, climate change, the ozone layer, all of the environment treaties are, are ne negotiated under UN auspices. Rights are all promoted under UN auspices. The, the CEDA treaty, the Treaty on the Protection of the Rights of Women, one of the treaties that, that uh, Brian Mulroney brought in was the, uh, you know, the uh, Convention on the Rights of the Child. He was a chairman of the conference in which that was adopted. So the UN, there's, there's a vast array of things that can be done at the UN that don't get done necessarily in the Security Council, but the Security Council is important. Is our seat at the G20 in any way equivalent to what a seat at the Security Council table would have offered? Not so far. It, it's very important. Uh, uh, the G20 is very important. It has described itself as the world's premier economic sort of coordination body, and, and it is that. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's coping with, first of all, the international financial meltdown in which on a one weekend in 2007, 2008, excuse me, in the fall, had the G20 finance ministers not succeeded in what they were doing, the British banks, there would have been a run on the British banks. A lot of banks, this is something they did on a Sunday, a lot of banks would have not opened their doors and the, and the markets would not have opened their doors, the, you know, the, the, the um, stock markets wouldn't have been opening their doors on Monday. We were that close to perdition economically. So they, you know, that's, that's uh, something that the G20 has done. I don't think the G20 will want to stay doing just, just finance for very long. But now, all of a sudden, what is, we're, we're into another crisis. That is a, a competitive devaluation, where there's about to be a currency war if the G20 doesn't, uh, you know, cooler heads don't prevail. And if the Chinese, frankly, don't increase their, uh, the value of their currency, which is what's bothering everybody. So it, it is very important, but it's not the it, but it, it's not an alternative to the Security Council. It, it doesn't have the authority to to mandate other people to act. The G20 can make can mandate itself to act. It can't make anybody else act. There must be other questions over there on the left. The gentleman on the beside the window. It's a tough question. I wish I knew for sure the answer. The last, uh, the last time there was an election, we put out some feelers from CG that there should be a debate on foreign policy. It could take place right in our magnificent uh, atrium here. Neither the parties nor the media were interested. Part of the problem is the Canadian media is just not interested. You, you, you can read lots of stories about what's going on, but there doesn't seem to be a sense in which that can be connected back to people. Unless it, unless it takes money out of their pocket, People don't notice, don't notice it. Maybe that's where you guys come in. Maybe, that's, maybe it's a generational thing. You're the ones who are going to be living more and more and more in the world. Uh, and I think that you know, you're going to go abroad and you're going to come back and you're going to know the significance of things to an extent that the current adult generation doesn't, doesn't know. The prime minister had never traveled outside North America before he became prime minister. We haven't asked much of our leaders in terms of international experience. Mulroney had international experience through his business you know, career. Um, Gretchen had some international experience, not much, and he didn't do a lot, by the way, uh, because he had been minister of every portfolio and cabinet almost, including the foreign ministry, so that he had some experience in that sense. Paul Martin had quite a bit of experience. Uh, so, you know, we've got to, one of the criteria we have to somehow criteria we have to get we have to somehow impress on people that matters is some kind of sense about the world knowledge some kind of knowledge of the world it's not a place to look if 50% of your work which seems to be the case when Mulroney was a prime minister 50% of the 
five zero percent of the paper that came to him was on foreign relations. And Harper has said how surprised he is uh, that how much of his time is taken up by international questions, foreign relations questions. Well, if that's the case, why don't we ask them if they've got any experience and knowledge before we elect them? But we don't seem to do that. You know, we, we can't, there, there's a, there is a myth, I think, in this country that foreign affairs doesn't matter politically. I think it matters a lot. Why is it, you suppose, that prime ministers like these G20 and G8 summits at home? It shows them on the world stage being leader-like. And that's a very important part of their image. So it must matter. To, at a certain level, it matters to Canadians. They don't, they, you know, there, there used to be criticism of Jean Chrétien that he wasn't polished enough to be a kind of international leader. Uh, but I don't know. I'm, I'm, at, I'm at a bit of a loss. When I, when I visit my relatives and I see how little they know about what's going on in the world and how uninterested they are, you know, and they're from Kitchener. You know? it's, they're from the heartland and the heartland basically is busy watching uh, Oprah. Are we being influenced by U.S. debates? Is it the Palin effect crossing the border? No, I've had a very interesting discussion with uh, Nick Nanos, who's one of Canada's premier pollsters. And he had some kind of cooperative effort with another one. And they decided that they would find out what the Tea Party influence in Canada was. And so they asked, the first question they asked a survey was, are you angry at the way things are going? 18 or 20 percent of the people said they were angry. So the, they designed the thing so that the people who are angry will then ask a bunch of follow-up questions. And they said, where do you stand? What makes you angry? Does a long-form census make you angry? Damn right. What makes you angry? Well, it's spread, the spread is exactly the spread of the whole rest of the population. Some of them are angry because of the long-form census, the you know, intrusion of it. Some of them are angry because, because the government's screwing around with the long-form census and shouldn't be. So their anger is all over the place. And it, you know, and, then they, and then they said, what about the long gun registry? Yes, we're mad at the long gun registry. Well, why is that? Well, the government shouldn't be trying to mess around with the long gun registry. Or the government should get rid of the long gun registry. So they split pretty much exactly like the rest of the population did. So the, the Tea Party phenomenon, I don't know, maybe that's the case in the United States, by the way. I'm not sure that anybody's done that kind of a survey. That might be interesting, it might be interesting to know. Are the women not going to ask any questions today? Or is, uh... I thought I saw a female hand over there. <laughs> okay. I think it, I think we, I think there's a danger uh, of uh, of turning inward. Maybe we've already turned largely inward, um, but that's partly what I'm. Let's see what time. That's partly what this book is about. It's a, it's a very optimistic take on Canada. It, and it, the basic premise is we've never been richer. Uh, we've never been better educated. We've never been better connected. We've never been healthier. And we've never been more secure than we are now. And that we have all the assets in the world. And be, you know, it's loads of assets. Our, the quality of our education system. We, you know, we're, we're pretty modest about our education system. You know, we're, you know where our universities rank in the world in terms of quality, according to the Times study? Third. Not 70th, not 192nd. We rank third, tied with, tied with Japan. The British are ahead of us, and the, uh, and the uh, oh, you can quibble about the, 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 the survey, but it, you know, it's, at least it's a survey that's being applied to everybody. Our, our, our high school students, which I, you know, and I used to, you know, it's a, it was my despair when my kids were in school. We rank third, fifth, and seventh in, in science, math, and reading in the world. There are 57 leading con industrial countries who participate in the survey, and Canada comes out with those kind of numbers, way ahead of many of the industrial countries. Look at our literature. Our literature is world-beating literature. Our music. You know, this is a country with a lot of assets, a lot of qualities, a lot of capabilities. There's really nothing stopping us, nothing stopping you from being world beaters. All that's holding us back is a little kind of self-deprecation and, and reticence about blowing our own horn.
But look what happens when we decide we're going to own the podium. By God, we own the podium. You know, you can do this kind of stuff. You know, it used to be the only thing that, you know, the, only, the only place that we demanded excellence from was from our hockey players. The rest we didn't care about. You know, but now we seem to. So I, I, think, I think that the ingredients are there. I think that, that we have all it takes, and we have a world that's working, for, working in our favor. It's becoming multi-centric. Some of those players are bigger players, but if, you, if there's ever a time when an agile foreign policy and an, and an effective diplomacy could help you, this is the time. We have the, the scope for, for maneuvering between these people is just endless. We can do all kinds of things for ourselves. We're really in very good shape. The only thing that's holding us back is a bit of a kind of, uh, I don't know, a tendency to buy a big HD TV screen and watch the world instead of participate in it. There's a certain passiveness in it all. Sorry, can you repeat? We're looking at IOPA. Ah, the sixty-four thousand dollar question. Yeah, it's a sixty-four thousand dollar question. I, I, I don't know. It's going to be very interesting, and it's a cultural issue in some senses. Some of the people I talked to said, "I was so angry at the government. I was so embarrassed. They're so, you know, they got us into this trouble, and they're blaming the liberals. That's preposterous." You know. And then you talk to some other people, and because I've been doing radio station radio interviews right across the country. The further west you go, the more it's the UN's fault. That's how it works. If it's, you know, with a little bit of a drop off when you get over the mountains, and then it starts to get a little bit more balanced. <laughs> but the whole idea is somehow, you know, it's, it's the UN's fault. We're manifestly great. So if the UN can't see it, who cares? It's their loss. You know, it, it, and, the, and the arguments are given that the UN is corrupt, the UN is run by a bunch of dictators, and they can't do anything. So I always say to them, well, you know, I guess we could take some solace from that view if it were true. And then I tell them why I don't think it's true. But I wish I knew the answer to that question, because it really should, this should trigger Canadians to get off the, their off seats, their off their chairs. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, the biggest difference. I'm not sure. Well, the biggest difference is that there's no major enemy. Uh, one of the difficulties you have when you're trying to justify spending billions of dollars on F-35s is saying, who are we defending against? In the old days, you could say the Soviet Union. You don't want to really say it's China, because you're going to end up creating an enemy where you might not have had to have one. And there are a lot of, and people are pretty conscious of that, especially the Americans are conscious of that. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a school of thought of strategic thinkers that, you know, there's always going to be, you know, vacuums are going to be filled and the, the sea lines of communications and there's bound to be a conflict. There isn't bound to be a conflict at all, I don't think. I think the whole strategic study stuff is, needs to be rethought. Anyway, um, what was the first part of your question? Biggest difference. biggest difference. The biggest difference is that there's no enemy. And the biggest difference is that the competition is economic more than political and security. And it's about getting rich, being healthy, uh, having quality of life. Another difference is that the United States will remain, in my judgment, preeminent for a long time to come. Because the, the country that has, was first on that list of university achievement is the United States. And it's, and it's, you know, it's, it's the most resilient economy in the world, even with all of the problems it's having. Anybody who counts the Americans out is, isn't reading history very well. So the Americans are going to be preeminent, but they're not going to be able to dominate. 
See, we went from two superpowers where there was a kind of a competition to one superpower where basically Washington was in charge, and now we're getting into a world where there's going to be a lot of competing interests. And relations being one of the things that we found in the Iraq war, which is very interesting, that relations between Berlin and Moscow were more important than they were between Berlin and, and, and Washington. Relations between, were more important between Berlin and Paris than they were before either of them. Relations between Beijing and, and Tokyo are probably, or possibly, more, in, more important than between Beijing and, and, and Washington. So we're getting into a different kind of, of, of a world. Uh, and, it, and in that sense, uh, we have, you know, it just opens up a whole lot of new possibilities. It also opens up the possibility for more conflict. When we had the, you know, the, after the, the concert of Europe, we ended up with uh, two world wars and a, and a lot of dead people. So the idea that there's min multiple centers is not entirely, a mix, not, in, not fully a blessing. But it is, for us, it gives us a lot of scope that we didn't have before. Um, and the second part was... Leaving aside the Iraq war and, and uh, Tony Blair, I would say the most effective diplomacy is probably carried out by the British still. The Norwegians are very good. Scandinavians are always very good. Uh, tends to be the smaller countries because they have to. The bigger countries, the easiest thing in the world is to be an American diplomat. You got all the power in the world behind you. If you're a smaller country and you want to get your way, you've got to be a lot smarter and a lot more agile. Smarter in the sense that you have to be quick to f understand what your interests are and how to serve them. The Americans can just say, we don't think so, and then things stop, or we want that to happen, and there's a presumption that it's going to happen. For Canadians, Canadians can't make either of those kind of statements. I, would, I used to think being the most interesting thing was being a Russian diplomat, a Soviet diplomat, because truth didn't matter. You could say whatever you wanted to say. All you had to do was be imaginative. You know, you could say anything, and uh, it was okay. It depends. There are a lot of countries that you can have a discussion. You can have a discussion with people which isn't, first of all, they have to trust you a bit, but you can have discussions which are more frank. I remember that I, 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 I the only nuclear weapon I, I ever saw, I saw in Prague. I went there for an exchange, you know, we, I used to be head of policy planning, which is supposed to be like a think tank in the foreign ministry, and I went and met my counterparts in Prague. And they were, re all they did was read Pravda to me. You know, it was, the, it was the party line right down the line. And you couldn't get them off that at all. Then I went to Hungary, and you get the party line right down the line, and then you get an interpretation that's completely different. So in most countries, you can get, you can get that. There were, there were cases where you couldn't. Why? It's never been easy to get American diplomats to talk to you, frankly. There's an there's a, there's a organization man kind of sense to them. Maybe because they have so much responsibility. Maybe that's the reason. But it's very hard for them to get them to say, you know, that's what George Bush thinks. I think it's nuts. You know, they never, you know, whereas Canadian probably may sound a little um, disloyal, but Canadians can say that lots of times. But it is, it's often the case that governments and, and uh, you know, I, I'd say the State Department was not on side for most of the George W. Bush's administration. Uh, and I think that uh, much of the, US, the British Foreign Office didn't agree with Tony Blair. And this, you know, it, it, it happens. I don't know what would happen in Russia if you disagreed. <laughs> yeah, I don't think. Yeah.
first of all, the government has to believe it's a problem. And secondly, there has to be, uh, you, can make, you can make a lot of cliched statements about the Canadian public having to want it uh, and, and having to be willing to sacrifice for it. Uh, we saw what happened to Stéphane Dion when he tried to bring in uh, action on climate change. We saw the rea we've seen, we're seeing the reaction in British Columbia to the carbon tax. And Canadians talk out of both sides of their mouths on this thing. And the government is probably right. The government probably is closer to the to the heart of what Canadians really think than, than the opposition is. Um, internationally, uh, we're at a, we're at an impasse. Huh? If we have an agreement, sort of an agreement, not much in the way of deadlines and timetables, and uh, and and uh, you know, concrete action more countries signing up to it than we're signing up to Kyoto. Some of the developing countries undertaking to do things, not that they would present them as, as commitments, but that they would, you know, there's kind of best efforts. It's very difficult to see how we're going to get anywhere on this. The U.S. Congress is not going to pass climate change uh, legislation. This Congress is not going to pass it. The next one seems even less likely to pass it. So I think we're in for several years of nothing happening in Washington. Uh, the Harper government's position is that, you know, that unless it happens in Washington, it doesn't happen in Canada either. Uh, so it's very difficult to do that. Internationally, I, you know, we, ha we had a conference here at CG uh, about a, two weeks ago. And the question was basically, pe people were wrestling with the question, how do we move this thing forward? Some of the best people in the world were wrestling with how do we move this forward. And I don't think we came to a very clear-cut uh, answer. Part of it is regionalism. You know, you have, the West, you have the Western Climate Initiative, you have the EU, you have various people trying to do some kind of semi-bottom-up work. You know, let's not wait for the federal government, let's not wait for the U.S. government, let's do what we can. The difficulty with that is that at some point it has to all be brought together because otherwise you're going to have a kind of crazy quilt of regulations and it'll, it'll kill international commerce. If every country has a different, has a different rules and different regulations and parts and sub, you know, sub parts of countries have different rules and different regulations, it's going to end up a mess economically. I think the way forward is, is for people to decide that this is really an economic issue and that it's going to be more expensive not to act than it is to act. That's a hard sell. Because that's all. Because the expense comes first, and the, and the consequences come later. And if you're a politician and you've got a four-year time frame, you know it, it, that's why they're all very happy to talk. You know, at, at the G8 summit, and the G20 summit, they talk about they talk about uh, you know 2050. That's you, we're all keen on meeting those targets in 2050. Nobody's going. Nobody has said, and that means we're going to start doing this today. So it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's the ultimate tragedy of the commons. It, it's the whole, everything, anything that belongs to everybody belongs to nobody. There's somebody over here somewhere too. No, yeah, I don't know. Somebody, I saw a hand go up over there before. And we'll come back. Yeah. yeah. It'll worsen it. It may have some. It may have some residual benefits among Pakistanis who are skeptical of what's going on in Afghanistan. It may have some residual benefits among some of the Muslim countries who, who, who are beginning to interpret the, the Afghanistan thing as a war against Islam. Uh, but in terms of relations with our allies and with Washington, I think we're seeing that already. You know, we're we're going. It's going to cost us. Is that a reason enough not to act, not to leave? No, I don't think so. But what I think is missing in all of this is a serious, we haven't seriously asked ourselves a question about what we should be doing. We haven't had a debate in years now on, on Afghanistan, other than on 
on what's happening to the people we take prisoner, whether they're being tortured or not, but on, on the fundamentals of what, what's going on. In my judgment, you should never set policy with, with deadlines. I don't think that you, you can't know what's going to happen. You can't know whether you're just about to succeed or whether it's, it's a preposterous waste and you're never going to get where you're going to get. So if, if, this is a, if this is a murderous mission that has no prospect of success, why have we waited until 2011? On the other hand, if this is a mission that really is doing some good, and, and you know, when you talk to a lot of Afghans, they think it's doing good, especially Afghan women think it's doing good. So, you know, then in that case, if it is worthwhile, why are you leaving in 2011? It, it's the one policy that they all could agree on, and therefore it's wrong. <laughs> Whenever you see all politicians agreeing with something, it, you can be pretty sure it's the wrong thing to be doing. I haven't been, but I wouldn't mind talking about it. Well, I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> um, have you seen potential players not only leave, but attend the National Union of Black Parts? Because currently, with the Harper Union, it's not necessarily there, and the liberals don't appear to have anyone. Um, no. Well, I, I'll give you two answers a, 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 a sort of flippant answer and a more serious answer. Um, if you, nobody thought, prime, nobody thought Stephen Harper was prime ministerial be, before he became prime minister. You know, the office conferred some significance on you that you might not have had. One of the things that you notice when you're, when you're, in a, you're a public servant in Ottawa is how smart cabinet ministers seem and how, how they get dumb afterwards. And part of it is that because they're invested with a lot of authority, and they have uh, you know, thousands of people advising them, basically. You know, it really does increase their capability. So, so that's part of the answer. And, and I'm trying to answer it from another way around. I don't know uh, who, who the bright people are in the parties. Uh, I don't know if they're all in the parties. I think there's something to be said for people who are not lifers taking some role. But it seems to be the case that people are increasingly going into politics as a career and staying there for, you know, without any other sort of work experience. Part of the problem that we have in Canada is a law of unintended consequences. We had said to ourselves that our members of parliament were not measuring up, that we'd see these other people show up and they all seem so articulate and so, and so impressive. There must be something wrong with our system. We mustn't be paying, and the conclusion was, we, we can't be paying our members of parliament enough money. So we better pay them more and we'll attract the kind of people that we really need to have in parliament. Well, it turns out that the people who passed the rules said, God, I, there's nowhere else I can make this kind of money. So they all stayed. We didn't get the turnover. We got people staying because now it's, really, it's a really good thing to be a member of parliament financially. So it, I, don't, I don't know. I'm, I think that we're bound to have a generational change. I, I think it's, you know, there's some, some of that is evident. And you can't know until the time comes whether we're the, you know, where the good people are going to come from. I'm undoubtedly there. I, know, I can think of a few conservative MPs who are really good. I could imagine those people becoming prime minister. I can think of one or two liberals who I think make, and one or two NDP also. I even think of one or two block MPs who make a good prime minister. But, you know, if they'd only kind of get loyal. <laughs> so it's, it's, it's uh, I can't answer the question in, in more than that because it's, it is very, uh, the, the thing that's uh, so difficult, compare the American system and the Canadian system. I much prefer the Canadian system to the American system for most things. Money is not such a, you know, money is the currency of the American political system. It takes mm -hmm. zillions to, to become uh, a senator or to run governor a president or a governor of California or governor of New Jersey, yeah. even. 
Uh, and we don't have that in Canada. And I think that's great because, it, because money corrupts. It's, cor it's corrupting that kind of money. On the other hand, we have a, they have independent members of Congress. Each Congress is his own entity. He's part of a party. But generally speaking, they are capable of not voting the party line if they want to. Uh, you know, they, have a, they talk about how difficult it was for Obama to pass a health care thing. Well, if this is Canada, and you got a, you got a 59 to 41 majority, you're going to pass it just like that. It's over. There's nothing to it. In the United States, all those Democratic senators were saying, well, I don't know if I'm going to vote for this or not. So you get, you get more independent-minded people because they have more independence. Uh, I was talking to a, last night here to a, a person who's a, who's a candidate for uh, office. And the question was, you know, how bad is it to be? How much freedom will I have to talk as a, as a, as a backbencher? And the answer is not much. If you're going to contradict a leader in public, you probably get away with that once. And, that, and, and if you do it twice, you can forget about ever getting an assignment. So there's a tremendous pressure on the members to conform. Now, Trudeau said, uh, no, 90 feet off the hill, all these MPs are nobody. The reality was the opposite. In their own community, they're all somebody. They get on the hill and they're nobody. All, they, all, they, all they're expected to do is vote when the time comes. How many unwhipped votes have we had? The long gun register. Uh, that, that's the only one I can think of in recent memory. All the rest are party line votes. It doesn't mean that you can't do interesting work in the committees and you can't you know, bring forward ideas and you can help and so on. But the idea that you're an independent operator is really uh, wrong. And that discourages people from entering into politics. If you, you know, if, if, if it's, it discouraged me. You know, I, th I thought to myself, would I rather be a, an official kind of advising on policy or would I rather be a, you know, a politician deciding on policy? Well, I'd rather be a politician deciding on policy if I got to decide. The problem is that I had more authority and more influence as an official on what was going to turn out to be the policy than the members did. Because the members were being told by the prime minister, you vote this way or you don't vote that way. It is very tough to be, it's very tough to sort of endure the constraints of being a member of parliament in Canada. And that's part of the reason why when you're looking for these next generation leaders, they're hard to see. Should probably make this the last question over here. Yeah, I think we're wearing people out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's not so much it undermined it, it is that it's that it distracted it, I think. Uh, we have a very strong economy. We have a very strong economy, and you, I'm not sure where you're... Uh, that? I don't know whose that is, but anyway. We have a very strong economy, and it started to get strong at the you know, way back in the late 80s, early 90s. It started under Mulroney, and then it was continued and increased under Martin, and we ended up you know, and we, we ended up with a, with a very sound system. Martin prevented Canadian banks from doing a lot of the things. It, it wasn't because our bankers were so much shrewder and sounder. It's that the government regulators didn't let them do the things that the Americans were doing. And, and, they, and we were considered staid and stodgy and unimaginative, you know, Everybody else was making barrels of money, and we were sort of plodding along. And then the bottom fell out on those people, and suddenly we looked like geniuses. But it had, what it really was was a very soundly regulated system. So we had a strong economy, and the conservative government, the Harper government, got to play that hand when it came to the responding to the crisis, and they played it strongly and well, I would actually say. But it doesn't, it, it didn't, 
you know, they perhaps because the prime minister is an economist or had studied economics, maybe he's just more interested. You know, Mulroney would wake up in the morning and ask himself about what was going on in France because of the Quebec issue, for example. My guess is that Harper doesn't wake up in the morning and wondering about what's happening in, in international relations. He's probably very keen on, on the economics of it all. So um, I, I, I think what happens is the G20 just kind of distracts. You know, it's, it's, if it's what you like to do, then you tend to invest more in doing that. Excellent questions, I have to say, wouldn't you say? Yeah, really fabulous yeah. questions yeah. coming from everybody. Thank yeah. you for that. And thank you so much, Paul, for that taking was, this was fun, yeah. sunny Friday afternoon to have this conversation about, yeah. uh, about foreign policy. Oh, the book. <laughs> <laughs> if you would like to purchase a, a copy of the book, they are for sale, and Brianne can help you with that. And of course, the beauty of walking away with one today is that the author might sign it for you, which is exciting. Yeah, I've already signed it. Oh, you've already signed them, even better. So then it's for sure. But I'll make it personalized. But he can personalize it. I can you. personalize it. <laughs> so won't you all join I me in, in thanking? <laughs> <laughs> sign them a couple of times, yeah. yeah. Um, please join me in thanking Paul Heinbecker for really wonderful. Thank you.